Hello, and thank you, Professor Jones and Dan Sox, for inviting me to speak about the work and, and practice of Paul Taylor, the American choreographer. In today's video lecture, I would like to share with you the life of a Taylor dancer and what it was like to create with Paul Taylor, uh, his, a little bit about his history and background, but also like to, to explore some of the various forms of style and, and what influenced his, his movement language. And if there's still time, let's hopefully we, we can take a, a maybe a deeper look at how Paul Taylor reimagined himself as, uh, as, a, as a dance maker. He constantly using obstacles uh, and, and restrictions and limitations to help him uh, develop his, what became his unique style of craft and structure in dance making. So uh, I'm Parisa Kobde. I joined the Taylor Company in 2003 and retired just last year in 2019. I was 22 when I joined the company and I was attracted to the Taylor Company because of the, the work, because of the breadth and versatility of, of the movement. I remember having just seen the company the year before I joined and I remember walking away from the program that I had just seen, it was just three ballets, and walking away feeling as if uh, a different choreographer had created each dance. I think that's a, that's a real good uh, explanation of, of, of the Taylor canon. Uh, the Taylor canon requires a strong technique in both ballet and modern dance, but that isn't enough. Uh, the the work, working with Paul Taylor really required versatility and also a willingness to learn and to be challenged. There was this unspoken rule between dancer and choreographer that was like, I'll continue to get better if you continue to challenge me. And uh, the, the, you know, when I joined the company as, as, as a young dancer, I didn't know what kind of artist I wanted to be, but I definitely found myself as an artist in, in the Taylor work. The, the Taylor work is everything from light to dark and everything in between. Uh, on any given day, depending on your mood, there was always a dance that you could, you could express yourself and throw yourself into. A typical rehearsal day with Paul, would start with class or technique at the school, and then uh, we would walk into the studio with Paul at noon. He would have a notebook, uh, having already planned what music he was going to use, and broken down the, the, the dance into sections, and in each section into phrases, he had counted it out. And very rarely had we even heard the music before uh, he started making the section on us. It was always uh, a surprise. But oftentimes he knew exactly what he wanted and he would uh, start with uh, a group of dancers that he had selected and he would just start moving people around the room. And, you know, person A go here, person B go there, and you just start mapping it out. And the next thing you know, we, we had a section. And then there were times where he didn't always know what he wanted. And he would sit in the front of the room and he would look at you and he felt compelled to start moving. And this was both, uh, it was a creative conversation that felt totally familiar and absolutely foreign every time it happened. But it was, it was exciting because we didn't know what was going to happen. Nobody did, not even him. So, uh, sometimes it was as simple as understanding what he wanted and offering him a movement that was a response to a prompt that he might have given us or offering him a movement that uh, to, to the prompt so that he either rejected or that he accepted and it's through that trial and error that we just we carved away we sculpt we sculpted an idea that we could just build upon 
the creative process was a dance in and of itself. It was a dance of discovery. It was very exciting. But a little bit about the company, Paul Taylor, without fail, created two works every year. He had two dedicated rehearsal periods, six weeks long each. And we also uh, had one annual engagement in New York City uh, that was about three weeks long. We did roughly 22, 24 dances a season. On any given night, you could walk into the theater and see a show. And you would never see the same show twice because there were so many pieces in the rep. But uh, in between these dedicated engagements, we would travel and perform to audiences in theaters, uh, teaching at universities and schools and festivals all around the world. The history and background of Paul Taylor. He was born in 1930, nine months after the, the start of the, the Great Depression, nine months after the stock market had crashed. And he was born and raised on a farm in Maryland to a single mother. He later went to Syracuse University to study painting on a swimming scholarship. He spent hours in the pool. And eventually he grew frustrated with trying to create art on a flat piece of canvas. He came across a picture book in the library uh, of Martha Graham, Martha Graham's, dance, Martha Graham's dances. And he eventually transferred to Juilliard and this is where he, he studied, he, he, he got a, uh, immersed and well steeped in, in formal dance training, Chiquetti and Graham techniques. And it was soon thereafter that he was scooped up by the dance legend, Martha Graham herself, where he danced for seven years as a soloist. Later, he went to dance for George Balanchine, Jerome Robbins, and Merce Cunningham before he formed his own dance company, the Paul Taylor Dance Company. In 60 years of his dance making, he created 147 ballets. So what influenced the development of the Taylor language? Paul Taylor has possibly the greatest range of repertoire of any choreographer to date. As a dance maker, his movement language was inspired by his own background as a swimmer and uh, informed by his formal training in Chiquetti and Graham techniques. As a dance maker, we, we start to see him, uh, the influences of, of him as a, a visual artist, as a painter, but in respect to the, the movement language in and of itself, we start to see him distill actual styles within his the, bro the broader style. Most important, I think, was that he, early on in his genitive dances, he experiments with so much all at once. Uh, for example, in Scudorama, that it, he jam packs too much but we see him go back and steal from himself and start to distill uh, a lot of that material in, in the course of his dance making. But Paul's work was often joyful, very complex, uh, but always human. And he called himself a reporter. Uh, he observed the natural world around him. He often said he could tell a lot about a person by the way they walked. At every audition he had for the company, he always started with a walk across the diagonal. He said he could, he could tell a lot about a person by the way they walked. He said a walk was like a fingerprint. So he explored with walking and explored with walking patterns in many of his early works, works which later evolved into uh, an aesthetic style of its own, an aesthetic form of its own called pedestrianism. And uh, I'd like to show you a, a clip of Eventide, a dance that he made in the late 90s that he completely dedicated to walking.
Paul Taylor was six foot two with an enormous wingspan. He, because he spent so many hours in the pool, he was loose and very flexible. And for someone of his size, he moved with great dexterity and speed. So I'd like to take a look um, at a short excerpt from Junction in 1961 set to Bach Cello Suite. In, in Paul's solo here, we start to see how he uses the back. And I think this is, um, this is harking back to his influence of, uh, by Graham. And in this, we see him initiate his movement all from the back and it propels him. It's what propels him through the air and so quickly. And in fact, he, he would often uh, remind us that he was trying to emulate the bow of, of the cellist. And each time we revive Junction, he would always get out of his seat and, and do a, a big contraction, a bit what we, what we called a swat. And he would always slap his lower back as if to say the contraction initiates from the lower back. So let's take a look at his solo in Junction. <laughs> In that excerpt, I start to see uh, the development of angularity, how he, he starts to break the pose down, uh, the contraction with disjointed arms and wrists. And I think that this particular style was um, in contrast to a dance like Oriole, which was lyric, known for its lines and curves. So we've seen pedestrianism, and we're about to see, um, we just saw uh, angularity in junction, and then he, we also begin to see other uh, developments of form in his language, in his movement language. We see archaic, which was inspired by 2D shapes. He has dances that are completely dedicated, dedicated to moving in, in, on a flat piece of canvas. Yeah, um, I'll show you more examples of that later on in, in musical offering. And then last but not least, we see social character driven movement, which I think is an evolution of pedestrianism. Yeah, because he's in social, in his social dances, he's taking uh, He's taking popular dances and reinterpreting them. So uh, in the next iteration of the section, I'd like to just speak a little bit about how his ballet training really influenced his work. I think that ballet is what gave him the strength and articulation needed for clean lines and curves, but the, also the ability to dynamically move across the stage and through the space. And it was his swimming and Graham background that became the cornerstones of his back exercise. We can tell he spent hours in the swimming pool because he, he really shows us in, in his solos and his earlier works how the, the resistance of the air uh, and, and the weight of the earth has on his body. And a hallmark of the Taylor back exercise is that the contraction is always initiated from the back. And in fact, in the back exercise, it always oscillates between release and contraction and extension and rotation and lateral flexion, all of the ways that the body, the, the spine moves. Flexion as in contraction, extension, high release, uh, uh, 
uh, rotation, lateral flexion. So this is a staple of every Taylor class. And more recently, in 2002, he actually uses the back exercise in his choreography in Promethean Fire. So let's have a look here. Uh, slight variation on the exercise, but uh, here we go. Let's have a look. So we've seen how his background as a swimmer and as a dancer influences his, his movement language. Now we can begin to look at how his, his uh, experience as a visual artist, uh, his background as a visual artist starts to influence his, his dance making um, skills and, and how he develops in his craft and, and structure. Paul's earliest works were all genitive experiments. And as he develops his own personal aesthetic, uh, we start to see him experiment with non-movement in the late 50s, in seven new dances and other postmodern themes. But uh, he, he basically earns himself a, a blank review because in one section, seven new dances, he stands downstage in, in a suit with a, a woman in a dress reclining on the ground. And the, 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 the score is 433, but it was a gift by John Cage, and it was just the, the announcement of the time as, as the minutes went on. And people started walking out of the theater, and this, of course, um, put him on the map. He very quickly got bored with that and then decided to go in the opposite direction. So while many choreographers were uh, emerging from the Judson Church with their discoveries uh, in the postmodern era, Paul Taylor made a white ballet. He made Oriole, and, and the, as the title suggests, it's radiant and bright, light and airy, and, uh, but actually it suggests this, um, it suggests white ballet idyllic but it's actually very earthbound and all of the jumps land on the ground, which is very different from uh, our, our, uh, our training in ballet. So now Oriole becomes his first major success in 1962. It's lyric in form in terms of his uh, movement languages. It's defined by its clean lines and curves. Uh, we start to see the, the V shape, the scoop, the S curve. And this dance and most lyric dances are very recognizable by audiences and critics around the world because these are the dances that are most often restaged by ballet companies and rep companies. So now, Oriole is revolutionary because he uses classical music uh, for modern dance. The score is Handel, and when he was asked why he used old music, it, he said because it was new to him. And another thing that's actually worth mentioning is that we start to see him as trying to balance being a director and a dancer. And it was really impossible, it became impossible for him to create and be in the dance himself. So often we see him dancing by himself. Uh, when there is a big group section, he very rarely interacts with other dancers. And I'd love to show you, uh, I'd love to show you him dancing again. Uh, in the second section, 
is is his big solo and it actually it was a it, it was the last thing that he made he made the entire dance and then uh went to make his solo and paul taylor was not a, a religious person by any means in fact he was an atheist but he does describe this this section as uh as a prayer and it had reverence for and reverence and adoration for the space and the earth and when you watch him dance it's almost as if you can see the energy starting from his center and and extending out through his limbs uh, to touch things that are far away the dance as a whole is is uh, it's a stunning ballet, but it's it takes place in this infinite space, but we only see a part of it on stage. And Paul wanted Paul uses entrances and exits as if uh, to give you the feeling that the dance is radiating and spilling out into the backstage and out onto the audience. So let's take a look at his solo from Oriole. 1962.
So now we've, we've seen his earlier works like Oriel, Junction, we haven't had time to see Scudorama, but these are early, these are, this is, these are the dances that are the genesis for the, the, the foundation for the rest of the, the, the Taylor canon. And we start to see Paul Taylor stoke his own creativity. He starts to create limitations for himself to force himself to make new discoveries. Um, and those restrictions come in the form of different kinds of obstacles like structure, space, and ideas. And to start with, uh, the obstacle of structure, in that golden era of modern dance, we, Paul Taylor was very prolific and we start to see dances like Art and Court, Company B, Musical Offering, that he discovers the, um, a structure that in somewhat uh, narrative in that it, he establishes a theme, he winds into interesting tangents, and then eventually he returns back to that main theme. So he's using geometry in the structure of, of the piece as a whole. And then we also start to see him play with geometry in, in spatial patterns. But uh, to, to dive a little bit deeper into this musical offering, um, he begins with the same music that he ends with. And both sections are the entire cast. They're both grouped. So we begin with a group piece and we end with a group piece. And in the middle is a turning point with some variation of, of a group section. And in between the beginning and the middle and the middle and end, he's got various uh, forms of groupings like solos, duet, a trio, quartets, another solo, another duet. And I would like to show you the duet from Musical Offering. And I think what's, what I'd like to point out here is that he, uh, this is the, one of the languages that we haven't seen, one of the movement languages that we haven't seen today is archaic. So archaic is the, the, the work that, the movement that's been, that's very iconic to Taylor, but it's been inspired by, uh, hieroglyphics of 2D images. So everything is flattened and that in and of itself is a restriction to, to move in that way. And musical offering was inspired by archeological findings of these wooden figurines in, in New Guinea. And um, uh, I love the idea. So, we don't have time to see this, but it, the, the dance begins with a woman alone on, stone, on stage and she's stoic as stone. And she's, she starts there and she, she begins to come to life and she starts to break free from this lifeless form as, the, as, as she starts to carve a path on the stage. It almost feels like she's carving through stone or through wood, um, creating the, the space on stage and creating a path for each member of, of the community of the dance company to join her on stage. And she starts to infuse this life into the group. Um, as we reconstructed musical offering just a, a couple years ago before Paul's death, uh, Kate Johnson had been generous enough in coaching me in this dance that depicts life and death as this eternal loop. Uh, I think Paul could have been thinking here of a dance company, the eternal loop of a dance company where senior dancers are replaced by newer dancers and the dances become the sum of all who have danced them. So it was, this was a gift uh, for me to dance and I'd like to share the duet with you. Thank you. 
So now we can look at how Paul uses space as an obstacle. He collaborated with Alex Katz on many dances over, over his career. And when asked what it was like to collaborate with Alex Katz, he said, collaborate. We don't collaborate. Alex creates a, an obstacle and I have to make a dance around them. And Last Look, created in 1985, is probably one of the most violent dystopian dances that Paul ever created. And to an equally haunting score by Donald York. Um, it's not too different from today in that uh, the world has gone mad, people's psyches are unhinged and their carnal compulsions outweigh any sense of morality. In short, we're all doomed. In this excerpt, you see a duet with Susan McGuire and David Parsons, and the obstacles in the space are mirrors. And in this particular duet, a mirror is the barrier between them. Uh, and it keeps these characters from connecting with each other, but at the same time, it's reflecting their own narcissism and selfish needs back onto themselves. Um, there are a few moments in the dance where uh, touching one another actually happens. And in this case, when uh, Susan McGuire crosses, the female dancer crosses the, the barrier, she's, uh, it, it turns violent. The man attacks the woman. So let's have a look at Last Look, created in 1985. <laughs>
So this dance feels particularly grotesque to me. I just remember, you know, it's choreographed to, to look into the mirror, to look at yourselves and then to look away. And I remember naturally, authentically feeling repulsed and, and I couldn't wait to look away. I, I was so disgusted. Um, and part of that has to do with the the angularity of the movement and the, the, the disjointedness. Remember that lyric, those beautiful lines and curves now have been completely uh, bastardized. So uh, last but not least, we have the obstacle of ideas. And Paul gave himself uh, the obstacle of certain thematic ideas. So often these dances are story, character-driven ballets that are focused on a singular idea or an event, such as Black Tuesday, about the Great Depression, Piazzolla Caldera, Changes. Uh, we don't have time to look at that dance today, but I, I hope that um, we might in the future. And which reminds me of, uh, a question that was asked of Paul back in 2010. Uh, he was asked, what is left uh, after all these years that he's not yet done? And his reply was, modern dance is a bottomless pit of possibilities. I've only scratched the surface, uh, just as we've barely scratched the surface of Paul Taylor today. So thank you.